Synopsis of the Books of the Bible. Psalms. By J. N. Darby. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17. Synopsis of the Books of the Bible. By John Nelson Darby. Psalms, Psalm 2. Messiah, God's counsels concerning his anointed. The next great element of the condition of Israel and the government of God is Messiah, the counsels of God concerning his anointed. Here the Hila are brought in, and form the principal subject of the psalm, and again we find ourselves in the last days when Christ's rights will be made good against the kings of the earth and all opposers. But Israel is again here the center and sphere of the accomplishment of these counsels of God. The anointed is to be king in Zion. The adversaries are the great ones of the nations, the evil reaching alas. To the heads of Israel who, as we shall find, shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes, an ungodly nation, Psalm 43, and as Peter also himself has taught us in applying this arm. The nation's presumptuous resistance brings ruin. I have said that the counsels of God as to Messiah are the element here introduced to us of the ways of God treated of in the Psalms. But the Psalm opens with the rising up of the nations to cast off his authority, and Jehovah's who establishes it, the apostate Jews, as we have seen, being engaged in this great rising alas! against God. The nations rage, the peoples imagine a vain thing, the kings of the earth, and the rulers would break the bands of Jehovah and his anointed together. But this rising only brings in wrath and displeasure, against which all resistance will be vain. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh, Adonai, see note, has them in derision, Jehovah, in spite of all, has set his king upon his holy hill of Zion. Such is the sure counsel of God made good by his power. Man's presumption in resistance only brings his ruin. Note. The Lord, but not the word Lord which represents generally Jehovah in the English version, but that which gives the Lord as an official relative title, end of note. Christ born into the earth, own son of God by Jehovah. But more is then brought out. This king, who is he? Jehovah has said to him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. It is one who, begotten on what can be called today, that is, begotten in time, is owned son by Jehovah. It is not then here the blessed and most precious truth of eternal sonship with the Father, though it is not to be dissociated from it, as if it could be without it, but one who, the anointed man, and that holy thing born into this world with the title, by his birth there also, of Son of God, is owned such of Jehovah. Thus, Paul tells us, this raising up Jesus, not raising up again, is the accomplishing the promises made to the fathers, quoting the psalm in confirmation. He quotes another passage for his resurrection and incorruptibility. Thus we have Christ born into the earth, own son of God by Jehovah. The king, yet to reign in Zion, is now rejected. But large counsels flow from this title. He has only to ask of Jehovah, and the heathen are given him for his inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for his possession. He will rule them with a rod of iron and break them in pieces like a potter's vessel, break with resistless power, ruling in judgment all that impiously and impotently rise up against his throne. But this execution of judgment is not yet accomplished. The psalm itself invites the kings and judges to submission and humbly owning the sun, lest they perish if his wrath be kindled but a little. He is himself to be trusted, and who can claim this but Jehovah? This summons to the kings of the earth is founded, remark, on the establishing the title of Christ to royal judgment and power on the earth. But is Christ set king in Zion? He was cast out of it and hung upon the cross for better blessing and higher glory, even that he had with the Father before the world was, yet cast out of Zion, to which he presented himself as king? And as to the heathen and the earthly inheritance, he has not yet asked for it, when he does, in the Father's time, he will surely give it, and so his foes be his footstool. He declares, John 17, that he did not ask about it, but about those given him out of it. The kings of the earth reign on, many bearing his name to be found yet in rebellion when he shall take to him his great power, and the nations be angry, and his wrath come. 
no rod of iron has yet touched them, the potter's vessel, broken as nothing, is not now their image. The Lord is not yet awakened to despise it. They reign by God's authority. But there is no king yet in Zion. Christ has been rejected. Meanwhile, we know he is Adonai in the heavens. The great elements of the latter day history in Psalms 1 and 2. We have now the great elements of latter day history a Jewish remnant awaiting judgment, the wicked being still there, the heathen raging against Jehovah and his anointed, he that sits in heaven laughing at their profitless rage, Jehovah setting Christ surely king in Zion, yea, upon his asking, giving him all the nations for his inheritance, the submission of all to be enforced by resistless judgment. No sorrows here, not even as to the remnant in Psalm 1, but the counsels and decrees of God and power such as none can resist. In a certain sense the kings of the earth did stand up and the rulers take counsel together, and, as to earthly power and scenes, succeeded. Christ was rejected and did not resist. The great principles as to the place of the remnant unfolded in Psalms 3-7. Where then is the remnant viewed in the Jewish scene of this world's history? What place have they? The great principles on which they stand are unfolded in the Psalms 3-7. It will be easily seen now how the first two psalms form the basis of the whole book, though the great body of its contents are the consequences of their non-fulfillment in the time to which those contents apply. Indeed in this, the structure of the book resembles that of a great multitude of psalms, the thesis stated in the first or few first verses, and then the circumstances, often quite the opposite, through which the saint passes to arrive at what is expressed at the beginning of the psalm. The five following psalms then unfold to us, in general, and in principle, the condition of the remnant and the thoughts and feelings produced by the Spirit of Christ in them, in the state of things consequent in Israel upon his personal rejection. The circumstances in which they find themselves are not historically alluded to till Psalms 9 and 10. Hence these psalms give the working of the Spirit of Christ in them in the suited moral fruits, so as to display the state of the godly remnant the holy seed that is in Judah when all is ruined. The principles of their state, the elements of feeling unfolded in it, are brought before us. There is not the strong expression which flows from the pressure of circumstances, but each moral phase is exhibited, the different feelings to be produced by the Spirit of Christ in relationship to God, 